I just want to tell you all a little bit about, first about this show, if you're here for the very first time, what it is about. And I want to talk about how I met David. So this is a series for 15 days called Shelter in Love. It's a series that you guys have asked for in the midst of this COVID-19 lockdown, we sheltered at home. And, you know, we're seeing all kinds of issues. And we people ask me that I could start a show that would help to deal with the isolation, with the anxiety, with the unpredictability. And I said, fine. And I decided to bring in a bunch of friends from all my years of being on this journey, on my inner journey. And uh, today is day nine in the series. And today I want to share with you about this amazing individual that you're seeing on the screen here, how I got to meet him. So the story goes back on the, I believe it's the 8th of March. Uh, a friend of mine invited me to an after party at a conference we were at, at the presidential suite in the San Francisco Hilton. So, you know, I go in there, it was about 11 o'clock and then I meet a bunch of other friends, just chatting with them. And about midnight, I kind of made my way, kind of circle around a table where there was a very interesting conversation. People were completely glued to this, whatever was going on. So, you know, I kind of settled down there, found a spot and started listening and just observing what was going on. And it was storytelling going on, storytelling at its best. So David was sitting there and sharing all of his years of working with President Obama in the White House and all of the things that happened that were not necessarily meet the mainstream media, things that we don't necessarily hear outside, just the subtleties and the beauty the personal stuff you know that was going on then of course we you know I, I got into the conversation I started asking questions and before I knew it it was 4 a.m <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you guys that that was probably one of the most intriguing absorbing conversations I've had in my life and so when I this request came about to create the series I said, you know, I reached out to David. I said, David, would you be willing to come and speak on the show? And he was like, so kind to be able to uh, say yes. And here we are. Thank you, David, for joining us. Where are you, where are you sitting right now? Jay, um, thank you for, uh, for inviting me and thank you for having me on. I am sitting in my home in Chicago, Illinois, okay. on the corner of 48th Street in Woodlawn, which is the south side of uh, Chicago. Um, it's, uh, it's an amazing uh, city for those of you who know it and even for those of you who don't, um, uh, but especially the richness of the history here on the south side of Chicago. So this is now day 40 of, um, of the lockdown. Uh, where I am sharing this wonderful space with uh, my wife and uh, my 14-year-old daughter. Um, and it's been uh, beautiful and challenging and all of those different, uh, all of the range of emotions in between, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah, talking about the range of emotions, um, David, I want to ask you, so we all read the news. We, you know, we all are aware of what's happening on the surface. So what I'm interested in hearing from your perspective is this new way of being of interdependence that I think this COVID-19 is telling us that we need to seek out our strength comes from our connections, our relationships, our togetherness, our unity with our neighbors, with our family, with our immediate community, but also it knows no borders. Just like COVID knows no borders, maybe it's a lesson for us to get out of our limitations. Could you tell us what is it that you're seeing in the wake of this new circumstances we're finding ourselves in? Well, Jay, it's, it's a tremendous paradox and there are just so many paradoxes because the way that in this moment, we exercise our interdependence is by sheltering and isolating, by physically removing ourselves from others in the effort to save others. And so 
just beginning with that um, and the profound change that for most of us um, it requires um, is really an interesting uh, moment. There, there is a there is a photo that is seared in my um, in my memory right now. I saw it for the first time yesterday. That at least in the United States, I think speaks to this paradox and the tension between my independence, me, and my interdependence, the transition to we or how I behave as a we in a community. And so there, there are a number of protests that are occurring in the United States right now where individuals and groups of individuals are going to their state capitals or to their city halls and protesting orders by the mayor or the governor, the leaders in those communities to shelter in place, to stay home, stay at home orders. And from what I understand, uh, most of that is driven by essentially the feeling that the collapse in the economy where in the United States of America, there are now at a minimum 22 million people who have lost their jobs in the past four to five weeks. And so that's 14% of the workforce. And so in the midst of these protests, there is a picture of um, a nurse, a woman in this case, wearing a mask and wearing gloves, standing in front of a building, confronting a man not wearing gloves or a mask, who was protesting the sheltering in place order. And Jay, for me, this one picture, without judging either one of those people or ascribing any motives to them, uh, is a perfect picture of that paradox, a perfect picture of that tension between me as an individual and the rights that I have to earn a livelihood, uh, to look out for myself, to make the choices for myself versus my responsibility to others. Because when I make that choice for myself, not only am I then in a period of a viral pandemic, exposing those myself and those close to me, but I'm exposing my community and others to it. And so that tension, certainly in the United States, um, uh, of seeing that interplay uh, is something that I've been reflecting on a lot. Um, and, and how do you navigate that uh, transition from me to we? How do you strike that balance between my sense of independence and interdependence? Um, and here in the United States, especially in this culture, uh, and I will only speak for this one, about the centrality of individual rights, um, that citizenship being expressed as my freedom to uh, up against my responsibilities as a citizen, how I exhibit civic character in order to further civic health. And so um, this is something that I've been playing with um, a lot over the past 40 days, and certainly in the past 48 hours, as that image becomes um, kind of a central anchor, uh, even of my meditation as I try to work through what we're living through. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite an image in, in quite a moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I want to dive a little bit more into this idea that you mentioned around transition. We in this country, especially, and you know, and I understand you, you understand this country, you work very deeply with the regulations and the laws and so on of this country. And in your opinion, what is that transition we're going through? And I'm asking this in the context of, on one side, there is a very clear need for us to, like in the words you've just used, interdependence for us to really look at, examine how our way of being and then our way of doing has been. But then this is a wake up call for us to probably expand the horizons of our way of being and doing. 
I'm curious, what is the transition we're going through? Because in the midst of this great need for us to come together, we still see these protests that are happening at the capitals in different states right now that as just you described, there is such a clear scientific evidence to show that this is something that we need to do, not only like you said, to protect ourselves, but also we need to protect the people that are working to keep our systems alive. So what is that transition that is bubbling up these resistance, this friction in society, that hatred that is still, you know, there when we need to rise about that? The, this is, um, and I'm glad you used the word opinion um, to frame the question because this is an opinion that I'm, uh, that I will use as the basis for this answer. Um, when you look at certainly not just political history but cultural history in the United States um, and in other parts of the world, um, there is this pendulum-like swing from uh, the communitarian instincts and needs to the individual instincts and needs. The past 40 years, the pendulum, in my opinion, has shifted uh, overly so to the primacy of the individual, the maximization of me, um, whether it's from a consumption perspective, um, or from even a self-actualization, be all that you can be. Um, um, the emphasis that we put both on terms of defining what success is, how much money I can make, how I can maximize profit, how I can uh, do this or I can do that in the signals that that sends, creates an environment where essentially, culturally, the definition of success, and for many, what it means to be an American is this maximization of me. Um, now, the trade-off there is that if you're simply engaging in a way where um, you're just focused on the me, you're never aware of, or even if you're aware of it, you're not factoring in what the effects are on others and those around you. Maximization of profit, what does that mean in terms of a broader community, in terms of income inequality? Or what does it mean then in terms of environmental degradation? What does it mean in terms of societal and cultural shifts where if you look at even the way communities are structured in the United States, where there are zip codes that are called super zip codes, where the most, the wealthiest live. But if from my home here in Chicago, which is a wonderful, um, relatively privileged neighborhood I'm living in, Jay, I can travel a mile to the south or to the west and go into neighborhoods where the COVID deaths in a place like Chicago, Illinois, where 30% of the population is African-American, 70% of the deaths have been African-Americans in the city of Chicago. And so the pendulum has, has, has swung so far to the me that one good way or a potential um, benefit and you never want to talk about tragedy in this way. But perhaps the way we come out of this is to understand very, very clearly that the actions that I take, the choices that I make, begin to have a very real and tangible effect because I can see them. So imagine in a few months, testing in the United States for COVID is ubiquitous, which it is not now. Imagine then once the testing regime has been put in place, there is contact tracing. In that moment of contact tracing that then says, I was in touch with Jay. Jay has become infected because of me. And Jay has infected four, five, six, seven, eight, nine other people. All of a sudden in a way that really hasn't occurred before, 
you begin to see at a very minute level the effect of a choice that I made to go out that day and to not wear a mask or not wear a glove because I thought it was okay. I allows me to see a downstream effect in a way that it, it, in some ways, Jay, it takes the abstraction out of how I am part of a we, how I'm, I am interdependent into something that is very real and tangible. And so that, as it relates to COVID, is how you can begin to see this transition from me um, to we uh, occurring in a place like the United States. And some countries have done this extraordinarily well, but you're very well aware, as are all of the people calling and watching this right now, that cultural and societal norms, the variation that occurs from country to country and community to community, where in some countries in the world, there is, rather than an over-indexing in terms of the individualistic manifestation of me, there is the indexing in terms of a communitarian approach, sometimes too much, where you lose a sense of who I am as a unique human being, right? So there's this constant uh, sway and back and forth, but what, where I see the transition becoming real is as uh, hopefully as we begin to open up communities and states in the United States. And those moments of choice and what it looks like to begin to manifest themselves there, hopefully then that, that the choice that I make can become ingrained, not just around COVID, but around the words that I use to interact with people, around the business choices that I make, the investment choices that I make, the political choices that I make, the communitarian choices that I make on a daily basis. And so this is um, a way where I can see the transition uh, begin in some ways. Fabulous. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, they say from your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> so we so need that. We so need that. Absolutely. So my next question is, is around relationships. One of the things, challenges that we're seeing, and I'm also I'm hearing regularly on this conversation that we've been having for the last nine days, is families are getting put into a close quarters. They're having to spend more time with each other, longer than they wished for, without you know the ability to go out and do their usual things. And relationships are getting tested in ways that we have never seen before. And as you probably heard the statistic, the divorce rates when China opened up their lockdown went, went through the roof. So would you share from your experience with being, working in high stress environments, I can imagine being in the White House, I can only imagine, I don't know what it's like, but I can only imagine that that would be probably at the epitome of being in a pressure cooker, if you will. And I'm curious how, and maybe this, this time we can bring in President Obama into the conversation and see, how did you, can you share with us a story of how you alleviated a stressful relationship issue? Jay, um, first of all, the honor of, uh, my parents are two Portuguese immigrants. They came to the United States in the late 1960s. And the fact that their son, me was able to for years get off that bus um the s2 bus on 16th street in washington walk across lafayette park and into the west wing of the white house every single day to serve the president and more importantly the american people um every day you walk into that building no matter how many times you do it there is both a sense of majesty um, but a sense of humility also that flows at the same time um, because of the responsibility that you face. And there's always that sense of, am I up to it? Can I meet this moment? Can we meet this moment? 
And so when, when you when you show up like that, and as you alluded to, every single day, you're to do a certain number of things on a day. By eight or nine o'clock in the morning, because a crisis someplace in the country or someplace in the world becomes your problem at that moment, whatever plans you had, just go out the window. And from a stress perspective, uh, there is both a heightened sense of it, but after a while, there's also a numbness to it, a desensitization that occurs. And so you condition yourself one way or another um, around those extremes. Now, from a personal perspective, it can result in a course myth. It can result in judgment about people or groups of people or even your colleagues. But one of the ways that I and we were so fortunate is the president and Mrs. Obama, uh, their sense of awareness, uh, their sense of uh, being rooted in their personal values about who they are, titles and abstraction aside, and going to the heart of, he kn knows and knew my daughter's names, knew my wife's birthday. Um, there was an instance where um, I'll share some about my parents, um, Jay. My parents, as I said, are two Portuguese immigrants. And for years, I tried to have them visit the White House. And I remember my father would resist visiting and one day he said something like um, oh people like us don't go to places like that there's a wonderful kind of humility a a, uh, a working class blue collar factory worker but even though he had become an american citizen that was not for him and so finally, my mother convinced him to visit in our final year in the White House. And um, they were in my office for a little bit. And then as we were leaving, and I didn't tell them what I was planning, all of a sudden we walked by the Oval Office. And my parents hear a very, very familiar voice. Uh, all of a sudden, they hear the voice of the President of the United States of America saying, David, are they here? And Jay, they stopped. And I looked at them, and the look on my father and mother's face, Barack Obama comes out of the Oval Office, walks directly to these two Portuguese immigrants. Uh, gives them, my father, the firmest handshake, gives my mother the deepest hug, invites them into the Oval Office. And now I'm watching these two human beings, my parents in Portuguese, and minha mãe, my mother, e o meu pai, my father, walking into a room that in many instances was um, the symbol of everything that they had aspired to when they were leaving. And then the president of the United States asked them to sit down, right? Now imagine this, now you're both sitting in your eye to eye, your level to level. You're, you're a group of human beings who are just interacting and having a conversation. And then he, out of an amazing generosity says to my parents, he thanked them for um, for allowing me and my family and the sacrifices that we make to serve. Um, that moment of kindness, right? That moment of seeing people, that moment of understanding that they were nervous, um, they were in awe. Um, but to reduce, reduce it down to the most basic and elemental level of here are a group of human beings um, who all have the same fears, 
we'll all have the same anxieties. We'll all have the same joys and dreams and hopes um, in a common level, notwithstanding the setting, was the type and is the type of humanity that in moments of stress, in moments of coarseness, in moments of us defaulting to our roles, it doesn't take much, Jay, but it takes an effort to see someone and to, you know, it's as if, and all of us have this experience with children, right? The next time you're with a small child, a four or five or six year old, and you're talking with them, go down to their level, kneel, right? And, 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 and it, it, it changes the moment, right? There's a, there's a, there's a physical openness. There is a, there's an empathy that flows from that. And so um, there are so many instances and moments like that. Um, but it came from one of the examples of leadership that then creates norms that establishes culture and behaviors that replicate. Because if all of us working in that environment can see the president of the United States of America, an individual who on a daily basis has to make the worst decisions, take the time to be kind and to show compassion, then what excuses do we have not to do the same? Amen. Uh, none. Amen. Oh, this is such a powerful story. Wow. So in the height of any crisis, the simple, what I take away from your story is the simple default solution is drop back into your humanness. There's nothing. We don't need to pretend to be anybody. We don't need to know the right answer. Just drop into our humanness. And when can we relate to the person or the people in front of us as people who are going through exactly what I'm going through right now? And that's, wow. That's, that's truly powerful. So, you know, you shared a story that night, which had me with goosebumps for a few days. Would you share about that thing where you talked about turning your suffering into a means of compassion? Do you know what the one I'm talking about? So is that the one about Governor Patrick the one, in Chicago? Right, the one that where, as an eight-year-old child, I thought that was, there's a powerful lesson there because we are all going through crises right now. There's all kinds of stresses on us. And the message there was around how do you turn your pain into a way of understanding the human suffering and then thereby have greater compassion for others? So... Um... Deval Patrick um, was the governor of Massachusetts, um, obviously, states here in the United States. He was in American history only the African as the governor of the state. As a child, he grew up here in Chicago, um, probably two miles from where I am sitting. And uh, he wrote about this story in a book that he published, his memoir about he was either seven or eight. And the day his father left his family. And so imagine an eight-year-old child listening, probably not for the first time, to that argument. You can have a memory or memories of being a child or even an adult when there is that moment of tension and friction that's occurring and there's a helplessness that you feel. The argument ends and you hear his father, little boy, runs after his father. And it's one of those days in Chicago, which for those of you who don't know, in the winters here, um, 
it can get very, very cold. Um, below zero Fahrenheit with the wind off of Lake Michigan in a way that is uh, searing. And it was one of those days here in Chicago. And Duvall wrote about how, as he chased his father down this cold sidewalk in Chicago, his father just pushed him away. And he wrote about how he can remember as essentially feeling the cold Chicago pavement of that sidewalk on his hands as his father walked away. I can't imagine, given what I just said about my dad, what that felt like for this uh, boy, for this young man. But then he started to write about essentially what that turned into for him. Right? He had a grandmother who basically then began to assume the role of the matriarch, of the patriarch, who notwithstanding that pain that he felt at that moment of being pushed aside and not validated and not seen and not heard would say to him every single day, remember who you are and what you represent. Basically summoning that pain and what he was feeling in a way that was all about turning it into um, something positive, turning it into something better official, turning it into a way to help others and to lead others. Um, it's in those moments, in one of the uh, terrible and wonderful things about the human condition is that all of us have them. While you and I can't speak for you, I can speak for myself. Well, I don't have that memory uh, that type of searing memory with my dad, um, there are all of these other memories and painful points and stories. And so rather than using that in a constant thought, in a memory about just the pain and how I am limited and how it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy and defining me in a negative way, how then can a young boy like Duvall or you or me or anyone else essentially turn that into compassion? And for me, the best definition of compassion is, which is different than empathy from my perspective, is empathy is, it is a necessary precondition. I feel what you feel. I connect with what you are feeling. I share the humanity with you. Compassion is, now I want to relieve your suffering. Not just feeling it, but I want to do something about it. And his life um, that I have seen has just been a perfect example of that transition, that, that taking of pain and suffering and then turning it into an opportunity to, uh, to be positive and to make other people's lives and the interesting thing about it, stories. It's one thing to go to anyone, even someone you don't know, and to say, you should be doing A, B, C, or D, or you should be positive, or you should be this, but fine. It's a wonderful message. You don't know me. You don't know anything about me. You don't know anything about my story. Now, if you engage with people and you, you are vulnerable first and you tell your story in whatever piece of your story that has some suffering or some pain, it then allows people to connect. And even though you don't know me, I see that you and I have this in common. And now I'm willing to go down this path and actually listen to you in a way that can maybe spark a little change and difference. And so thank you for reminding me of that um, 
of that story. He, um, all of us are human uh, and all of us have our challenges, but he um, exudes integrity um, and decency and compassion. And uh, I am fortunate to, uh, to be um, a friend and to know him. So thank you for asking that, Jim. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, that was very powerful, like I said. Which my friend brings us to the next um, section of this conversation, which is the meditation. You're so profound, David. I would love for you to try. Would you like to try to lead a meditation? Uh, I would. I would prefer that you uh, that you lead. I, um, as I said to you via email, uh, I've never um, I've never actually led a meditation, even though I've had a practice now for a good eleven or twelve years, and so. Um, Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, well, that means there will be a next time. I was going to push you right now and say, David, there's always a first time. But all right, my friend, I'm going to honor your request. Thank you. So drop into this love affair with yourself, whether you're new to it or have been doing it for a number of years. Just take in some deep, comfortable breaths. I want you to breathe into your belly, just like when you see a baby sleeping very peacefully you will notice the rise and collapse of the abdomen, not the chest. Breathing is a very powerful way to regulate your emotions, but it's something that you take for granted. Through your breath, you can activate your parasympathetic nervous system, the calming response in your body. One of the most calming breathing exercises that you can do is to breathe in to a count of four, hold, and then breathe out for about twice as long, say to a count of six or eight. And as you are breathing in and out, see if you can constrict your throat and make the sound like an ocean. Breathing in for a count of four, holding and breathing out like the ocean.
as you're breathing out, especially through these long exhales, you're activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which reduces your heart rate and blood pressure. Breathing in the fresh air. And as you're exhaling, let go of any tightness in the body. With each exhale, Focus on a different part of your body, making sure it's relaxed. Starting with the scalp. Going down to the neck. into your shoulders. Into your chest. to your abdomen. Into your hips. into your thighs and down into your legs. Into the very bottom of your feet. As you're breathing in, notice how the breath is happening quite naturally. You don't really have to do anything. Just like being in the flow of life. As you breathe in and out, You don't have to really particularly do anything and yet your life depends on it. And if you're breathing in and out without any aid, like a ventilator, you need to be extremely grateful because there are millions today at this moment that are not able to do this simple act that happens so naturally for you. As you're breathing in the fresh oxygen that the body needs, exhale what the body does not need such as worry, tension, 
anxiety about the future, or some resentment of the past. Notice through this very simple exercise how your mind might have become a little bit more clear. The body may have become a little bit more relaxed. And how this might be conditions for seeing the world with a broad, broader view. Being calmer helps you to broaden your perspective in life. Thank you. So friends, I, those of you who have joined into this webinar, this is your time to please queue up any questions. We're gonna get into the Q and A. We're gonna read out your questions to David and uh, he shall respond. So first thing, while people are queuing up the questions, David, I got one thing I have to ask you, which it's always been on the back of my mind. So how do you call the 44th president of the United States. So do you call him Barack? Do you call him president? Do you call him Mr. 44th? I, I'm just curious. Uh, I, uh, everyone is different, obviously. I always refer to him as Mr. President. Um, similarly, uh, in the few times that I have been able to see former President Clinton or uh, the former President's Bush, Every time I have seen and met those individuals, similarly, I always refer to them as Mr. President. Um, it's, um, and for me, Jay, it's because of the symbolism mm -hmm. um, of the office. Mm -hmm. um, each one of them obviously handles it differently, but um, uh, so that's, that's my preference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, oh, fantastic. It's good to know that. Yeah, that's great. All right, so I have some questions here. So first one is from Alberto. Um, great insights, battle between the me and the we. In the political realm, as they say, it is all about emotions. Trump makes it about anger, fear, threat, victimization, taps into the me. What emotions did Obama tap into making it about the we? Um, so the, the different campaigns in 8 and 12 were very different. In 2008, a couple of weeks before the November election, both Senator Obama and Senator McCain had approval ratings and favorability ratings in the 60s, which is unimaginable uh, today. And so that election, even in the face of um, a, a global economic meltdown, um, in some ways it was easier to make it about aspiration and about hope um, because essentially the view of the two protagonists in this case, McCain and Obama, um, were, were favorable and good. And so in some ways, even though there's a tremendous amount of anxiety, um, Obama, because of his biography and because of his approach to leadership as a community organizer, had always defaulted to the, we can do this. Um, yes, we can. Um, 
he would reference that the most important word in the English language is we, we the people. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Um, and so it's, it's core to him. Uh, now in 2012, the, uh, the favorability ratings for President Obama and Governor Romney were much lower. The tone and tenor of that campaign was much more contrastive. There was more of a negative tone to it. Um, and so even in an election dynamic, that is both a function of the two protagonists and the moment in time, different campaigns approach them very, very differently. But the good news for me about President Obama is that to his core, um, he had always felt comfortable and rooted in that, that we type of approach. Um, it's at the center of the work that he's now entrusted us to do with the Obama Foundation. Um, in his farewell address as president in January of 2017, for me, the most important line in the entire speech was at the end, where he said, I am asking you to believe one more time, not in my ability to bring about change, but in yours. And implicit in that is don't look for the exalted man or woman on a pedestal. You have all you need. And if you're gonna execute against that in a way that is consistent with your emotion, with your vision and your commitment, you have to be rooted in that sense of every individual has power, every individual has voice, but no one can affect great change by themselves. We only do this together. And so even, you don't even have to look at it as a hopeful and aspirational thing. There's also a deep pragmatism to the reality of, you know what, if I want to make my community better, I may believe myself to be uh, the most brilliant, uh, most effective, most transcendent, whatever. So what? I can't do anything alone. Um, and so that's, now what does a moment like this call for? Um, you know, without getting into the protagonists, in a moment of anxiety and fear, uh, which the next six months are gonna, in some ways you can imagine they're gonna be the defining characteristics. Um, it is an open question whether or not the next six months will be about, um, as my old boss Deval Patrick would say, uh, an election, or a contest about whether or not we turn to each other or on each other. Mm. Because each of those approaches can be effective. Um, but again, always default back to who are the protagonists in the story and what is the circumstance at that moment, the story, that they are embedding themselves into in the contrast uh, around the story. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating thing to break down into component parts, even in elections or any type of choice that people make. What are all of the underlying assumptions in facts, in experiences that then go into the story that's being told? Uh, around it. So um, I think that's the way I think about that. But yeah. thank you for your question. Yeah, a great question. I agree. So you mentioned something about, so the Obama Foundation. Um, I don't think most of us know exactly what is your aim and objective with this foundation? Uh, the aim and objective is to find a million Barack Obamas and a million Michelle Obamas and connect them together in the largest network of change makers the planet has ever seen. Incredible, how's that going? Um, it is um, one of the most inspiring uh, and difficult uh, tasks. Uh, inspiring insofar as um, 
um, I see every day people who are doing amazing things in their community. So there is an abundance of values-based change makers in every community on the planet, everywhere. The difficulty is then, how do you weave them together? How do you connect them in a way that isn't about what they do, because everybody does something differently, but is aligned around why they do it, the common set of values. Um, my shorthand, Jay, is, the, is what I just referred to, is you, you can lead in one of two ways, by having people turn to each other or on each other. Um, how do you create this universe of change makers that are aligned around a way of leading that is about having people turn to each other? Because even in a sense of community, and I am guilty of this as well as everyone else, you can define community in a very exclusive way based upon whatever identity is the most salient to you at that moment. Um, community can also be something that is punitive to others outside of a community. It is insufficient to say that I am a community builder or a community organizer. Um, this is where the values uh, uh, come in, uh, come into play, and that's that's an important piece for us. I have a great question here. Uh, Cloud is asking, what are some practices that yourself or Obama do regularly to increase your sustained energy, resiliency, and joy? So I will only speak for myself and not for uh, the former president. Um, I am a, uh, I am first of all an introvert. Uh, in for me, I define that as I regenerate. I uh, get energy from moments of solitude um, and quiet. Um, they are they are nurturing for me. They they fill me up. Um, and so knowing that about uh, myself, my routines. Uh, that are essential for me to maintain that type of hopefully resilience, although I fail every day, uh, multiple times per day. Uh, I've have my meditation practice, which is the first thing in the morning uh, to just sit um, for whatever period of time and um, different types of practice, depending upon where I am. Uh, this morning was an insight practice where I was wrestling with some thoughts um, and to try to clear ego and try to clear abstraction and to focus on as much of the essential as I could discern at that moment. And other times I just need to be with my breath. Uh, I just need to. And so that is the first thing. I immediately then transition to. Um, a form of journaling that's more of a stream of consciousness. No preordained theme, nothing. I'll just write for half an hour. Um, and every once in a while, there will be something that will pop. It's like this moment of creativity um, that is important. And then as soon as I'm done with that, um, I am fortunate enough to own a Peloton bike. Uh, and um, spending a good half an hour on the bike. So that, that routine of mind, spirit, and body um, sets me up um, for the day um, in a way that I see now, although a lot of this is just construct and story. I see that uh, many times if I don't do each and every one of them, uh, then, but again, this is story where later on in the day, I'll be saying, well, I didn't do this, therefore. Uh, but again, that's, that's the mind doing what it, uh, what it does. Mm -hmm. now, that's great. But, but I'm very curious, and I'm sure everybody on this I'm sorry, Jay, you broke up a little bit. 
of the exquisite detail like you've just did for yourself. I'm sorry, can you say it again? Because you broke up. I think we have a little bit of a lag here. Did you get a question? No, I didn't. Okay, sorry. Um, so the, the question I had was, you don't have to go into such detail, but just real quickly tell us what was Obama, President Obama's practice for his own resilience? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the most important thing, one of the most important things that I saw was that if he, if, if he were in Washington, if he was in Washington and not traveling, dinner with his wife and daughters every night was sacrosanct. It was not to be violated by the staff or the team or unless it was obviously a, a cataclysmic emergency. But that time at a dinner table with your spouse and your two small children exchanging how was school? What did you learn? What was interesting? What did you talk about? I think a normal, some normal um, aspect of life. Um, he describes it as something that um, um, filled him up, that, that, that uh, sustained him. Because the building and the position can be one of the most isolating um, places. And just because of the, uh, the majesty and the power, if you don't have those moments of basic humanity, you can begin to see where you change slowly and then over time it accretes and builds and builds and builds to the point where you can begin to believe all of the trappings and everything else and there's there is nothing more humbling than a teenager telling a parent that you know what you're not that impressive <laughs> yeah. 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 and i get that every day <laughs> David, I have some fabulous questions. How much more time do I, you know, I asked you for an hour. Just, I'm curious. Yeah. You got some time? I've got, I've got two minutes, unfortunately. Two minutes. Wow. Okay. Let's take one more question then. So Dave is asking this question. What is your biggest fear and your biggest hope in this situation? My biggest fear is that uh, our civic health not just in the United States, but globally, I will focus on the United States. Our civic health is poor. Our instinct to other eyes, people who don't look like us, who don't agree with us, to judge, to demonize, to not understand and not try to understand in a pluralistic democracy that is based upon consent, and openness and engagement that in this moment, that picture that I was talking about at the beginning of this session together of these two human beings standing six feet apart from one another was a great example of, again, I'm now judging. He didn't understand her she did not understand him and all of us around them in the arena can see that picture and depending upon our perspective will negatively judge not just one or the other but anyone else like that and in moments of crisis the danger um, is profound and real so that's my 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 fear is that the other metaphor to use is around a civic fabric. And in many ways, our fabric is ripping and, and, and frayed. My hope is that there are expressions of civic character where people begin to um, 
people begin to see each other and people begin to see the interdependence and people begin to imagine citizenship not just as something I do every couple of years in voting or in serving on a jury, but citizenship is reciprocity. It's relationship. It's, um, it's uh, the stake that I have in you and that you have in me. And so that is, that's the hope that I have. And so Jay, thank you. Um, my wife just gave me a text, so let me just respond to the text right away. Okay. All right. So while uh, while you're responding to the text, done. let me just... Oh, you're done. Oh, wow. You're quick. Uh, uh, yeah, I told her I'm going to be right downstairs in two seconds. So, um, uh, Jay, what an honor uh, to spend this time with you and to spend time with everyone in this uh, community. And I wish that you stay safe, um, that you stay whole and healthy, and that all of us are part of the solution uh, coming out of this. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Very, very grateful for your time. Thank you so much for the beautiful words of inspiration. Just a quick plug to let you all know, tomorrow we'll come with a person from a different part of the world. I have a friend from Karachi, Pakistan. Tahir Khan is going to be my guest. So until then, be well, be safe, and have a beautiful day.